But right now, I'm going to invite Pastor Carl Lewis. I've known him for, yeah. Come on. I'm, a matter of fact, Pastor Carl Lewis was a part of our church and our staff, was a pastor for many years. And he's going to let you know a little bit more what he's doing right now. But I felt that I need to invite him to our church. Amen. Because this is his church too. Amen. Hallelujah. And so let's put our hands together and, and welcome our dear pastor. Come on. Praise God. Bless you, man. Appreciate you. Yep, yeah, I'm good. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good, right? And his mercy endures for how long? Praise the name of the Lord. It is a real pleasure to be with you. Just an, really an honor. Congratulations again to the graduates. Good to witness that. And the goodness of God, I want to, again, this is a very special place, a very dear place in, in our hearts. And uh, Colleen, my wife, and um, Elizabeth, they're not here, uh, regrettably, but they do send their love. I do have Carla with me. She'll be, you'll see it very shortly. Um, but again, I want to say thank you so much, Pastor Paul, for your gracious invitation. You know, your pastor, from the day we met, this is over 30 years ago, he just had a love for people, a love for the lost. I mean, he would go out on the streets anywhere to reach people with the gospel. And reconnecting with him, surely, you know, I, yeah, that hasn't changed. And that's a wonderful thing to see. So again, thank God for that. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, you know, greetings to your staff of the Board of Elders and the job that you do, your executive board, the deacons, uh, Ministry of Helps, home group leaders, you know, Ministry of Helps has a, a very dear part and dear place in my heart for the work that you and everybody who's here today, greetings in the name of the Lord. Amen. Now, before we do something, turn to someone beside you and tell them this. Will you do what I say? Just tell them this. Tell them you look real good to me. And, and, then, um, and then look to the person on the other side. Look to the person on the other side and tell them, I don't know what the other person said to you, but I want you to know you look real good to me. Well, it was great. So here, so it was so soft. But so Praise God. Okay, now, I know we're on the time, and I'm going to watch the time. Will you give me about 30, 35 minutes? We're going we're to be good. Will you do that? It's really important what we got to share with you today. But let's say this to begin. In the name of Jesus, I declare the blessing of God is on my life. Because of God's blessing, I increase. I multiply. I am fruitful. I am abundantly productive and successful. As I hear God's word today, I'm not just going to hear it. I'm going to do it. I will act upon the word of God. And God's word in my life will produce good fruit. And I will be a blessing to everyone I meet and those in my sphere of influence, I believe that. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, let me begin by saying this. You know, um, it's, you know, in seeing the acknowledgement of various graduates and those who are moving in different places, and particularly those who have taken their place in the local church, in this local church, I, you need to know, that is a joy to God's heart. One of the things I've been teaching um, is um, that the members, members, that we are members of the body of Christ. And when people take their place in the local church, I tell you, it brings great joy to Jesus. 
And so I know what it's like to be a member of, of a great local church, you know, Evangel Temple. Um, I know what it's like to experience the love and the grace of a local church family. I know what it's like being here to experience people who love you, who celebrate with you in, in good times and different things that you accomplish. You know, when we got married, my wife and I, we celebrate uh, 33 years this August. And so we know what it's like to have people who love you and, and celebrate and, and invest in your life and, and share even with the joy of having children. And so it's wonderful. And many of you, you know what that's like being here. And you never take that for granted. You always celebrate that and thank God for that. We also know the, um, the importance of the love, the support, the graciousness of a, fam of, of a local church family when you experience challenges and trial and testing. And, and some of you that are here, you were there many years ago when Carla was born. And she was born three pounds, sorry, one pound, one pound. Someone say one pound. One pound, eight ounces. And so um, we never forget the people that uh, loved us, who prayed with us, who believed God with us. I tell you, sometimes what people don't realize is this. The unity of a local church has more to do with what happens in people's lives than we think. And you realize unity can, will um, oftentimes determine whether people receive from God or don't. You hear what I'm saying? I never thought of that till just right now. But you see, but we, we understood we were recipients of the, and benefactors, uh, beneficiaries, excuse me, of the love of the people of God praying for us. And I was on staff at that time when Carla was born, one pound, eight ounces. She was in the isolate for three and a half months from March to June. I mean, that's a long time. And you know what? Without anyone asking, we had ladies come to our house to clean the house for me. We had ladies who came to our house. A couple of ladies in particular came and they made meals for us. Now, we never asked, but out of the love of God, out of their hearts. You know, we had people praying for us. Are you listening to me? And some people praying for us, we didn't even know because of the size of this wonderful family. And so letting you know, you never forget the power of a local church family. Amen. And so I stand with you on, before you on behalf of, of myself and Pastor Colleen with great gratitude, great appreciation for the love of God in a family. Amen. Also, let me also say this. I'd be amiss if I didn't say, share this. Um, when in leaving this place, what led to that was this. I, I had the opportunity, Pastor Paul talked about, you know, serving in this local church and being on staff. We had the high honor of serving a man of God, Pastor Bud Williams. A man we loved, a man, a man that God connected us to. And again, it's one thing to serve in ministry of helps and just to be a blessing, but then to be called upon to be on his staff. What an honor. And you understand, this was a man, I mean, I knew no one in this country who had the office of an evangelist stronger than him. And he just, he, people would win, come to the Lord like that. They're just, just so powerful. His passion for Jesus was beautiful. His love for the people of God. I mean, his character and integrity, as far as I know, was unblemished. Just a wonderful man of God. We, what an honor to serve, you know, in his vineyard, if you will. Amen. And we, I tell you, all these things you get poured into, and it helps to shape you. It helps, to, to, helps you to set a high standard of value and character and integrity in your life. But, you know, um, in serving around uh, over 20 years ago, the Lord spoke to me and told me, um, I never asked for it, but the Lord said, uh, um, I want to heal my people. I'm telling you, because I never had an argument with Pastor Bud Williams, excellent unity in, in promoting his vision, helping him. 
But you know, the Lord can interrupt you as you obey him. And so the Lord spoke to me about his healing power. He revealed some things from Luke chapter 4 about the tangible healing anointing of God, that his power is tangible. But what from that time? So, you know, I heard his heart. I really want to heal my people. And so I had to obey that call. I said, are you willing to step away from what you're doing? And that was the hardest thing to do because of my love for the man of God. Every you know, it's important to be obedient to God. And that's what we did. It was a challenging time, but we had to obey the Lord. And that's what um, we could say compelled us to step away from this great church and step into a ministry, step into the unknown. But you know, that same year the Lord called us into that particular ministry, that same year. And you know, Aon is your, your maintenance overseer here. Same year, I was in my office, the same year, and that was the year after Carla was born. I was looking at some of these things that the her miracle happened. We're able to share that miracle on 100 Huntley Street and also on, um, there's another network, and more recently, 2018, we shared it on Daystar. After, a year after she was born, a year after, is when the Lord spoke to me about that healing power. And Ian came into my office, and he sat down and said, Pastor Carl, his son at that time was nine or ten. He can correct me if I'm wrong. And he said, my, my, the doctors saw in his heart there was a hole in his heart. Remember, this is, he's sitting in my office here. And, of course, you don't know what to do. It's an impossible situation. And he said, now he's recounting this to me. I forgot about this. He, I met him a few months ago again after many years. I didn't see him for a long time. And he recounted this to me. Now what's powerful is when someone experiences a miracle, they remember the details more than anybody else. So he's recounting, because remember, I didn't remember this. So a few months ago, shared it with me. He said, we prayed. Now he remembers the prayer. I don't remember the prayer. He just said, Pascal, you prayed, and then you said, and it is done. Now, it's an amazing, sometimes you'll say certain things with a certain boldness from the Lord because it's from him. A few days later, Adolfo's mother brought him into the hospital. Now, think about this. He's in Jamaica. His son is in Jamaica and is here. Tell, turn to someone, tell them, all things are possible. All things are possible with God, right? With God and to him that believes. So anyway, a few days later, they take him back to the hospital. The doctor looks, does whatever they want to do under their instruments and tells him we don't know what happened, but the hole has been filled up. Isn't that powerful? I remember, I don't remember, this happened again that same year. Then he tells me this. Now, I've never met his, his son before. That's over 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. His son now, and I've never met his son, he said his son is now living in London, Ontario, married with his own family. You know why miracles are so powerful? Because they are, we could say that they're, they're advertisers of the goodness of God. And can you imagine his son could maybe not be here today but a miracle preserved him so he could have all the children himself. I tell you, talk about the goodness of God. Amen. And so we stepped into that. We could say stepping into the unknown and seeing God's power work, you know, through us. And then we, you know, I need to share this. The Lord said about a year ago, I said, you don't talk about miracles. And he knew what was my problem. Because he knew I was thinking, if I talk about miracles, I'm talking about myself. And he said, no, every time you talk about miracles, you're talking about Jesus. You've got to tell these miracles of what God has done. So many of you, you know the goodness of God. You need to tell it. As a result, Colleen and I, we had challenges. Um, uh, uh, Colleen uh, miscarried a couple times. 
Your breakthrough is an answer for somebody else. Did you know, listen, as a result of what we experienced and believe in God, there's a number of couples today who the doctors said could not have children who have children today. We're talking a number of them. I was in Mississauga, lived in Mississauga, and close to a, as a, a minister that I ministered for in Mississauga a number of times when they were developing their church and, and teaching on leadership. And um, one of his leaders, I was in his area and he asked me to come by. And I was just sitting at their kitchen counter, just sitting at the kitchen counter. And he said, you know, me and my wife, they've been married for like seven to 10 years, doctor, they couldn't have children. And they didn't know what the diagnosis was. And I said to him, do you know Exodus? I just said it matter of fact. I'm just sitting casually. Do you know Exodus 23, verse 25 and 26? And then I just read it to him, quoted it to him. You know, worship the Lord your God. He'll bless your bread and your water. He'll take sickness away from the midst of you. The number of your days he will fulfill. And he said, uh, um, there will no one miscarry in your land. And he read and he saw it. But what happened is this, when I said it to him a couple of times, his, his eyes lit up. Faith came. He, he, so we prayed. The year later, a child was born. Listen, we never relegate God to simply the natural. Are you listening to me? Later on, again, in obeying this call, of God. I'll never forget, I was in Scarborough. Again, a young church we were helping. I'd gone there for the first time. I'll never forget this miracle because of what happened. God healed people in that meeting. I mean, those ladies said she had a high blood pressure. One had diabetes. She said, in the presence of God was so strong, she felt her pressure just go right down, right in the presence of God. But what stood out, there was a man in the audience, in the crowd. It was a small meeting. And I'll never forget him because he had this winter, thick winter sweater, kind of an orangey, yellow, kind of nice, bright sweater. And he came down and he said to me, can you pray for my friend? Now, his friend wasn't here. I said, why? Because he has cancer and he only has a few days, maybe a month to live. And I said, we're going to, just like how these people experience the presence of God, we're going to believe God. And I said, does anybody have an handkerchief? No handkerchief, but there was a paper towel, paper towel. Someone say paper towel, paper towel. And I said, we're going to pray. We're going to lay hands on this and this power of God that went into these people that you witnessed. That same power is going to go into this cloth. Let me tell you what happened. Because the pastor told, called me shortly after that, maybe a month after. That man, and I told the man what to do, and he followed the instructions. He took that napkin, charged with the power of God, took it to that his, good, his sick friend's wife. Now, remember, this is what, now they're recounting this to me. The man's wife took that paper towel and dabbed it on his body. Remember, this is what I've been told now. As he dabbed it on his body, the man began to sweat. You know what happened? See, the power of God worked. The man, I was told, six months later, the man was still alive. Listen to me. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Let me share one more. Listen, I was in England and we're, again, we're ministering the power of God. What I'm, Lord is saying, we've got to believe these things regardless of our disappointments. Faith has to get higher again that God is a supernatural God. Our limitations are not his limitations. So I was preaching the word of God, just a simple message. I mean, that was back 20 years ago when they didn't, um, they said England was cold and non-responsive, but it was different for us. I'm telling you, I was preaching in, in an old Victorian house, just, you know, good, staunch British people, and some of them all white people, just a, but they received the word of God, just powerful. 
was preaching in one place in, Blo- in uh, I think it was Blockswitch. And um, we preached the word of God. Then I just went down and we just laid hands on the sick. Now, we never made any much fanfare. And we were just worshiping God. The people were worshiping the Lord just like how your worship leaders were leading us in worship. And then I heard this, this commotion, like just, it, was, it could, was loud. I'm wondering, what's going on? So in the back of my mind, I'm just worshiping with everybody. And I turn around, and there was a lady who was in a wheelchair. She got up and started walking. Now, her story was this. She had a degenerative brain disease. That's for a number of years, and she couldn't walk. All of a sudden, she's walking. Isn't that wonderful? And I say, why, why we have to talk about this? Because sometimes we can hear these things, but it's completely different when you see it yourself. Do you hear what I'm saying here? And then what was all doubly beautiful, that same young woman went to India on a missions trip the following year. Isn't that wonderful? I'm just sharing you because I felt, I said, Pastor Billy Paul, if you don't mind, let me share with the people what, 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 how we left and, uh, you know, just our testimony. You know, from that, the Lord added to us the ability to work with pastors and leaders, to train pastors and leaders. We've written six books. One of them is a foundation for Leaders 101, and some churches have used it to help to train their leaders. Um, we've also got, of course, media network and some things we're doing, of course, our website. And so, again, what an honor to serve the Lord. And so much of that because of what was invested in our lives in this local church. Amen. So we're glad to be here. Now, what we're going to share real briefly here. Do I still have a few minutes? We're going to talk about the power of a new life. I'm not going to keep you too long because... I want some of that barbecue myself. But here's the, um, the thing. Just ponder these questions because we're going to answer them today. What motivates us to give people our best? Here's another one. Why do we passionately tell, share, and proclaim the gospel? As your pastor already said. What compels us to go to nations, that missions team that's going to the Yukon? You know, why do we treat people that we seemingly have little in common with? Why do we treat them with dignity, honor, and respect? Why do we despise and deplore racism? Why do we reject inequality based on sex? Why do we stand against any spirit of oppression, subjugation, and hate? Why is the church the greatest place or the greatest demonstration of unity amongst people? And why do we reach out to our neighbors and serve them with the love of God, regardless of their sins, regardless of their religion, regardless of of their past. We're going to answer that in this message, the power of a new life. And part of this, what I want you to see, some things I've been mulling over the last number of years, is the Lord's put in my heart a greater understanding and appreciation to help us know our value, our worth, our dignity, why you are so special. I'm going to start with me. Turn with me real quickly. Genesis chapter 1. We've got to move real fast here. Let me begin by saying this. The greatest demonstration of God's love love for us, or the greatest demonstration of the value and the worth that he places on us is when he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. That was the, and to, to, and to be raised from the dead, to be ascended into heaven, the greatest demonstration. Imagine God sending Jesus to die for us. Think about this. You don't pay such a big price for something of no value. You don't give heaven's best for something that is nothing, that is negligible that is worthless. Every time you think 
of the cross of Christ. Every time you sing these wonderful songs we sung today, that it should echo in your mind, reverberate. This is how valuable I am to God. Are you listening? This is who I am to my maker. This is how much he loves me. This is how valuable that I am. And so Genesis, I want to start here. Genesis chapter 1. Because there's some things, once we get born again, there's some things God wants to get established in our lives that will help us to really um, maximize our potential and really realize his dream is best for our lives. So I'm going to start with Genesis chapter 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I normally go with the King James. King James is in my brain, in my head. But sometimes I'll look at some of these other translations and preach from them. uh, Because sometimes the language is real good. Um, So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. I really want you to appreciate, as believers, the life of God that's in you. God wants us to really... You can be born again and live and die and not really tap into the fullness of the life of God. And I want to encourage you into this, to really appreciate on a higher level this new birth experience, this life of God that is in us, that when you said, Jesus, come into my life, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, a miracle actually happened. And why, when we go over some of the, I know you've been a well-taught church, you've known some of these things, but I'm just telling you some things that I rehearse a lot of times. (laughs) It's what makes me who I am. It's what gives me this zest and zeal for life is because I know who I am. I know more and more increasingly this life of God in me. Amen. Are you ready today? So listen to this. Genesis chapter 1. Now, pay attention to this, really important. Genesis chapter 1, it says, Then said God, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, I want you to listen to these verses because these verses tell us who we are. Now, much of the confusion, much of the challenges in the world and even in the church, it stemmed from us not understanding certain basic things. So right here, right in the beginning of the book, we're going to get to this thing about the power of the new life, is God tells us that we are created in whose image? Whose image? You gotta let that sink in, because don't let it go over. You gotta so you're gonna have to look over this. Whose image are you created in? Now it says image then is the word resemblance, likeness. That means then if words mean anything, human beings are the closest creature creation to God in the universe than any other creature. Now, you got to let that sink in. You were made in the image, the likeness of God. Now, think about that. And he made two models, the male model and the female model. Now, again, if words mean anything, this, this is elementary. Think about this now. So I refer to myself. Now, think about this. My name, that you're, you call me Carl Lewis, but Carl Lewis is let's say a human being, a son of God. Think about this now, a son of God. This is who I am. I am a son of God made in the image of God to be like who? God. That's who I am. Now, I happen to live in a male black body. Do you hear my language? Now, this is specific Because the the misunderstanding of that is what leads to a lot of division, a lot of separation. Who am I? A son of God. Made in the what? Image of God. Made to be like God. 
That means all the time I'm learning how does God act, how does he live, and I live to look and be like him. I walk around in a male black body. When I know who I am, I'm able to see other people differently. The stronger we are in this, I look at another person, in many cases, the way I see myself. I look at my brother, Pastor Paul, as what? A son of God. Made in the image of God. Made to be like God. He's a male like me, but he has a different shade. Is anyone hear what I'm saying? It takes care of the sexism problem. Because I look at my wife, I look at any other a woman, I look at them what? Made in the image of God. Made to be like God. They just happen to be living in a what? A female body of a whatever color or shade. Do you understand that? But because the church in many cases has been very weak in that, we've acted like the world and talked like the world. But when you know who you are, Oh, I tell you, you know how that's so powerful is this? It means that because the more you know who you are, you don't allow yourself to be judged by people according to their standards. And it means now you're, the expectation you have of yourself is much higher. Much, much higher. Now, can you see then that takes care of abuse in the home or in the family. It takes care of me thinking I'm superior to my wife. Is anyone hear what I'm saying? See, because we still, we use all these hierarchical structures, really Roman Empire and Grecian Empire thinking, to subjugate one another. So in the home, does it mean, listen, I'm, <laughs> even when we say the head of the home, we better know what that really means. Because for some men, if they don't understand what we just read in Genesis chapter 1, they think I'm the boss and you better do what I say or else. No, that's not a Christian talking. No, that's a fool. Now let's look at this. Genesis chapter 8. We've got to know who we are. Genesis chapter 8. Listen, listen to this one. Um, verse 5 says this, Yet you made them only a little lower than God, this is what the New Living says, and crowned them with glory and honor. King James says a little lower than the angels. But if you look in King James in, a, in the side reference, it will tell you the word angels is the word for God. That's what it says. So it says a little lower than God. God made human beings as close to himself as he possibly could. Now we've got to see this because if this is true, can you imagine the value, the dignity, the worth he's placed on every human being? Do you see that? This is why the more you get this, you start seeing people with the eyes of God. You start seeing people that they're worthy of, de of respect. They're worthy of our best. Are you listening to me? Can you imagine how our homes when you start realizing then your wife and your husband, you see each other made in the image of God. You see children coming out of that. And it just, your love changes because you see one another differently. So you've got to understand, so, so God, God, can you imagine God creating us in his image? Can you imagine the joy he has over the human family? But the pain and the sorrow it must bring to his heart when we don't treat one another as made in his image. Now go to this, John chapter 1. I'm going to go real fast here. Now, you see, because we're made in the image of God, made in his image, we resemble him, we're like him, made to be like him. God has a higher expectation of us. Now, listen, John, um, John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, But to all who believed him, at Jesus, 
and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth, resulting from human passion or pain, but a birth that comes from God. Turn to someone, tell them, I am a child of God. Tell them, I'm born of God. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. I'm going to go, keep going. I'm going to read this. Listen. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can a man be old man be born, be go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Now, I see the so I know this is elementary stuff, but think about it. We are so important to God, the human creation that is, made in his image, that Jesus said this, you have got a natural physical creation, but because you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a physical body, you must be born again. You must come back to God. You must be restored back into right relationship with God. So turn to John chapter 3. You know this. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Again, why are we so important to God? Why do we treat every person with dignity and value and respect? Why do we spend uh, to, um, go to the greatest expense to take the gospel to people, no matter where they are or who they are. John three sixty. Listen, this is the um, because we're loved by God, because He's compelled to bring us into His family. He's compelled. I mean, to get get us into right relationship with, him, with Himself. He says, "For this is how God loved the world." Someone say, "That's me." He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. In God's eyes, think about this, in his mind, in his heart, we were worth the price. I want you to let that sink in. Think of how valuable God sees you. You know, people say God can do without you. No, he couldn't. He couldn't. In his mind, I can't do without my creation. Now think about, think about this. Some of you have had children, and you might have had a, children who got, a child who went astray, living in a way that you never taught them. And most of you, If that child came back today, you'd accept them just like that. And even when that child is out, you're still praying. You're still loving that child. Sometimes I think we think we love more than God. If we think like that, what about God? He couldn't live without us. He couldn't look into eternity. Of course, he is eternity. He couldn't look into that and, con- and conceive of a future without us. Just think about that. That's why he was willing to pay such a price. Are you listening to me? No price was too high. That's the value he's placed on you. Turn to this one real quick. Coming down here. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 23. Getting more to this. For you have been born again. This is the language here. But not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. King James probably says it the best way. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. You know, that's almost like a biological transformation. I want you to think about this. There's a life in you, a new life in you. Get into my message now. 
So there's a life of God in you. It says you are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Listen, something happened inside of you when you got born again. I'm thinking about, I'm going to use the word biological, because something happened. Something changed on the inside of you. Are you listening to me? The new birth is something real. Listen, it's not necessarily, it's not psychological, it's not mental. It's first spiritual. So we could say, listen, it can say being born again. Jesus said you must be born again. What got born again? Your spirit. The part that came from God, the part that makes you like God, was regenerated. Peter says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. So in you is the life of God. It is a supernatural life. It is a powerful life. It is a life that enables you and I to live in a way we couldn't live before. So can you see now, listen, so God's expectation of us now is much different than when we were, were not born again. So where we lived in sin and bondage, he say, now my life is in you. Will you live according to this new nature? Will you allow that new nature to take a hold of your life? Glory be to God. Amen, somebody. I got this one, two more, I think. Listen to this. Look at this last one, Galatians 2. Galatians 2. So this life of God regenerated your spirit. This life of God in you and I enables us to live a pure, holy life. Think about that. One of the things what God wants to get the church into is that we're no longer sin conscious. By that I mean we're no longer worried about, well, you know what? I'm going to fall into sin. That was some of the old stuff when I, when I was growing up. As a teenager, I'd hear that stuff a lot. People were afraid of the devil, afraid of this sin. You know, it's almost like, you know, if you're going to just fall into sin. No. When I remember this scripture as a young man, Romans 6, write it down, verse 7. He that is dead is freed from sin. Am I perfect? No, but when I realized you mean sin is a choice, you mean the devil doesn't have all that power to make me do something? You mean I'm dead to sin and I can live in victory? I mean, listen to me. well, That's good news, somebody. Now listen to this one, Galatians 2.20. Listen to this. Got a few minutes here. Listen, my old self has been crucified with Christ. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen, a new life came on the inside of you at the new birth. This is what Paul preached. Listen to what he says now. Listen to the conviction of this. My whole self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Listen to this. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself for me. Because he said, now I live in this physical body. See, he is aware of his makeup. See, he realizes I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a physical body. He said, he was aware. Listen, there is this new life of God in me that I'm allowing to control and dictate my existence. Isn't that wonderful? So now I don't allow what I feel to control my life. You see that? I don't allow what people may think about me to control how I live. Are you listening to me? I don't allow what the, let's say, the culture of the present age to determine how I live. There's a new life in you. Are you listening to me? So this life is powerful. This life is a victorious life. This life, you know, it demands that I love my brother and sister. It demands that I repent when I do wrong. You know, let me say this, you know, as a married man, and any man who's married long enough knows this. You learn how to say, I'm sorry. 
I'm convinced that's one of the reasons I'm still married. I learned how to say I'm sorry. Did you know that's a, a Christ characteristic? That we're willing to humble ourselves and say, I'm sorry. You know, I don't know how many times, particularly in the, old, the, old, the uh, early years, my wife would upset me, do something, and I'd go to the Lord. The Lord and, you know, I'm expecting, Pastor Paul, don't look at me as if you don't know what I'm talking about. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you're going to side with me because you know she's wrong. You know she's wrong. Talk to her. Do something. And what's amazing? He never talks to me about that. Never. Because what was the Lord doing is, is he was always pointing to my responsibility. Are you listening to what I'm saying? My responsibility. This Jesus life in us. God wants it to fill our homes. Fill our relationships. Are you listening? This Jesus life, this Jesus nature. Can you imagine it? Husband and wife, we speak to one another with love, with care, with compassion in our homes. That when we're wrong, we humble ourselves and say, honey, I'm sorry, please forgive me. You realize sometimes I realize I'm wrong, but I'm right, but my tone was wrong. And I would do it, say, honey, I'm sorry. And, and she does the same thing. So when you start having that, you start having a little heaven on earth right in your home. And then you add children to that and you start speaking to them right. And what I had to learn, I learned when from the very young, you know, you raised your voice at them. And I know, see, you got to understand, we've got to get out of some of our trained culture. A lot of cultures believe they never say sorry. Parents never apologize to their children. Never. See, that's their culture. But they never change their mind. They never change their thinking. I remember going down and say, Carla, please forgive me. You know, I'm six years old, I raised my voice. I, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Someone say this new life. This new life, I'm telling you, it will change our homes. It will change our relationships. It will change our churches. It will change the way we look at communities. Is anybody hear what I'm saying? It will change how we look at other people. You see, so we, our love goes beyond our culture, naturally. It goes beyond people who look like me. Why? I'm tell because I know the value Jesus has placed on every human being. Now, I'm going to close by saying this. Boy, I tell you, listen, and I'm telling you, Paul said he lived by this life of Jesus that's in him. But you see, oh, listen, to, I got my last one, Romans 8, Romans 8, listen to this one, talking about this new life, Romans 8, 10 and 11, Christ lives within you. Listen, Christ lives where? Within you. That's what I'm saying. It is a biological transformation, though spiritually, happened on the inside of you. Christ lives within you. Boy, just think about that. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Where does he live? And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Can you see what he's trying to say to us today? We've got to become more aware about what this new birth is about. God, Jesus never came to introduce a new religion. That was the mistake of the church. He never came to introduce a religion. He came to make us acquainted with his Father and to inform or reveal us to us his kingdom and how we, he lives, how he operates. Say, the life of God is in me. Say it again, the life of God is in me. So the challenge you and I have is this, is that, we have to be now trained. Someone say trained. 
because we live in a physical body, we have a natural mind. We've got to be trained to live according to this new nature. And it means we have to disconnect from a world system. See, see, that is not according to this new life and live according to this new nature on the inside of us. Loving people. Are you listening to me? Loving people. Not being divisive. Not looking to separate yourself from people. Just loving people. Seeing people through Jesus' eyes. Can I challenge you with a thought? You know, when people said this, people looked at um, the war in the Middle East. And I, I don't want to say it, but anyway, let me say it. I want to show you how we think. How we got to, we got to, there's a real challenge to our thinking. So people said this. Immediately, I saw some posts. People said, I am for Israel. I know this is going to challenge you. A lot of Christian, a lot of Christian leaders. I am, I stand with Israel. I saw other interesting things. So guess what some people are saying then? I stand, for forgive my language, but if you come to church to learn something, I stand with Israel, and what's the equivalent? To hell with the Palestinians or the Arabs. The question is this. Does God love everybody the same? Did Jesus die for every person? Does every person, think about this, have the same value to our Father because of what Jesus did for them? Is anyone hear what I'm saying? This is what makes the, the Christian, when we think right, the most powerful force organism in the world. We can stand proclaiming a real love of God the real love of God to all people. Does anyone hear what I'm saying? I know that's a challenging thought for some today, but it's the truth. Now, let me say this. I want, to, I want you to, um, we talked about, I am cl- closing right now. Could you stand with me? Just stand with me, please, real quick. I want to just lead you in a confession. It is an identity confession. Paul, Pastor Paul, am I okay still? Just give me, I'm I'm good. An identity confession. Say this with me. Because God wants us to renew our minds to think like him. Say this with me. I think upon the God thoughts. My father thinks about me. And I'm building the right image inside of me. I am renewing my mind to think like God. I am proving for myself, setting my heart and mind on experiencing God's best. I am a child of God, made in his image and likeness. I am God-like because my father made me like himself. I am creative, inventive, and productive. I've been created in righteousness for good works. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm worthy of his best because I am my father's child. I eat the best live in the best, wear the best, drive the best. I have good and godly friends, relationships, and associations. My business flourishes, and everything I put my hands to prospers and profits. I am a new creation. Come on, in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away, and all things... I've become new. I am wise. I am righteous. 
I am sanctified. I am redeemed. I am pure, just, and innocent, no longer ungodly, filthy or guilty. I am blessed. I cannot be cursed. I am made for good things. The blessing of the Lord is on my life. I have the mind of the anointed one and his anointing. I am sharp. I am quick. I am alert. I am very intelligent. I have more understanding than all of my teachers. I am surrounded with favor like a shield. The blessing of God comes on me and overtakes me. Everything I put my hands to prospers, increases, and grows. I'm made for good things. For the Lord has said, No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. I am blessed, and I'm a blessing in Jesus' name. Just raise your hand before the Lord. Thank you, Father. I thank you for your people today. I thank you for your grace upon their lives. I thank you for the new birth, praise God, which we celebrate, and the new life of Jesus that is on them. Oh, we thank you today. We worship you today. Just thank the Lord for a few moments here right now. Just thank him for the new life. Thank him for the new creation that you are in Christ Jesus. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I tell you, you can do so today. That now is the day of salvation. Just say from your heart, Jesus, I receive you. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you bore my sins. I believe you were raised from the dead for my justification. And I call you the Lord of my life. And I'm going to live for you all the days of my life. Let's celebrate Jesus right now. Let's celebrate the life of God in you. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Even now, if there's sickness in your body right now, I just reach forth right now. Just before I step down right now, just put your hand on that part of your body that's sick. Father, I pray right now that your healing power, the presence of Jesus, would go into the bodies of the sick, the diseased, and the afflicted now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for removing cancers from people's bodies. I thank you right now for removing sicknesses and diseases where there's been weakness cause strength to come. I'm, I command bones to be made whole. I command the bone marrow to be made right. I command blood cells to be corrected in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I thank you now opening eyes, opening deaf ears in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you now for the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus flowing into the bodies of your people, quickening them with your life in the name of Jesus. I need someone again to celebrate. I need someone again to thank God for this life of Jesus. Glory to God. Come on, Master Paul. Hallelujah. Someone celebrate that life. Celebrate the life of Jesus. Hallelujah. And tell him today, I'm going to live according to this life. I'm going to live according to this life. I'm going to look at people the way you see them, Jesus. I'm going to bring your good news. I'm going to treat them right. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to give them your best. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much again for your paying attention. Allow me to minister to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Bless you all. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Park.